just to give you a little bit of background on who I am and why I'm talking about what I'm talking about. Um, I'm a teacher and a student. I teach at SGI, which is a language school, a private language school in central London. And I'm just finishing now my master's in English language teaching and applied linguistics at King's. And this presentation is a report on the findings from the project which I undertook for my dissertation. Um, now, Martin mentioned yesterday that people remember information better if they think the speaker has high prestige. So I'd like to just mention now that I'm very important and influential. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the um, I'll give you a bit of background to the project, explain the methodology that I followed, and then get to the juicy stuff, the methodology, before I draw some conclusions. So, um, the background. Teaching context, as I said, I, I teach at a private language school in central London. It's quite typical of language schools in central London in that we have about 4,000 students over the year, and we have about 20 teaching staff, mostly native speakers. We have two non-native speaker teachers, um, and they have quite a wide variety of experience, from one year up to 20. Now, the multilingual classroom is typical of that context. We have classrooms of up to 12 students, and sometimes each student has a different first language background. And that represents an environment where English is the lingua franca. Maybe not outside the classroom, as they're living in London, and they might be communicating with many different people, but definitely inside the classroom. Um, some of the teachers at SGI, at my school, have noticed some breakdowns when their students communicate with each other, and they often attribute that to pronunciation. Now this is the area of ELF that I'm most familiar with, and that's what I chose to look at, was the pronunciation side of lingua franca English usage. The problem is, if you put yourself in the shoes of a teacher in that classroom, whose students have 12 different first languages, it's very difficult to know where to start with helping them develop lingua franca pronunciation, because a lot of the pedagogic material that exists is intended for bilingual teachers who have the same L1 as their students which is probably the most common teaching situation for the ancient world, but it's not my situation. So while I was learning about ELF and wanting to work with it, I kind of didn't know where to begin because I didn't know how to find what my students had in common. Now, if a teacher wants to help the students in the classroom communicate more effectively with each other, we have a tool for that from Jennifer Dinkins' work in 2000, the Lingua Franca Core. So this list of sounds or aspects of pronunciation which appear to be crucial for mutual intelligibility in ELF. Plus, the listener side, accommodation, but for reasons of scope, this is an MA dissertation, so I didn't cover an accommodation. I focused on the lingua franca court. And to me, this seems like an opportunity to get down and dirty, to use Nikos' phrase, with ELF in the classroom. We have a context which seems to need it, and we have a tool which might help facilitate it. So the problem is, if you want to do that, teachers need to be able to identify areas of overlap among several L1 backgrounds. They also need to know the LFC, the Lingua Franca Core, and recognize its features. I don't know how familiar you all are with the Lingua Franca Core, but it covers several key areas, such as individual consonant sounds, uh, but not the and the. Uh, no flapping of t. So like one of the um, attendees earlier was saying, no city, but city. It also covers the placement of nuclear stress. Um, it doesn't include word stress. It doesn't include intonation in its conventional sense of rising, falling attitude, but it does include um, groups of words and nuclear stress placed within those groups. So it's a relatively small subset of all the many features of pronunciation which you might be addressing in classroom where you take RP as your model, for example. And so teachers wanting to teach the syllabus on that basis would need to know what those features are. And then they obviously need to prepare to teach that. So if you have a list of features which you want to focus on, you need to be prepared with what to do with that in the classroom. And this is where I felt that existing resources weren't enough. In my own experience, I was learning about ELF on my master's, I wanted to do something about it, and I couldn't really begin without reading chapters and chapters and chapters on Spanish, French, Italian, Hungarian, Turkish, Chinese, Japanese, and trying to work out what they all had in common so that I could make the most of my classroom time with my students. So I came up with an ingenious solution. 
solution, which would keep me busy for the next six months of my master's. Um, I used a grid format. It looks like this. I have copies. If you want to look closer, I can give them to you later. Um, it has the 12 most common L1 backgrounds represented at my school, because that's where I was going to try and use the grid. And it's filtered against the labor frank report. So you can see what the different languages might have in common in terms of probable difficulties when learning core items. Um, it has accompanying teacher's notes on the back with limited jargon because I found that my area of interest is pronunciation and phonology, but a lot of my colleagues aren't familiar with a lot of the terms. And looking through the literature, different authors use different terms. So where somebody says a consonant might be dropped at the end of a word, another person says elided, another person says omitted, so I simplified everything to make it more familiar for my colleagues who are going to test the resource. And there's also a list of suggested resources for teaching to try and address that issue of preparing to teach. And all of the books are available in the SGI staff room. So I tried to do, to remove as much of the legwork as uh, possible so that my colleagues would be able to use this resource to try and teach a syllabus that would help their students understand each other's pronunciation better because they said that was problematic. Um, this is just a snippet of the resource, so you can see languages across the top, some core features down the bottom, and I used a kind of key where um, the darker the square, the more problematic this is likely to be. So for example, if the square is white, like it, all of these languages are likely not to have problems with the sound in general, but they're all likely to have trouble with aspirating it sufficiently in English, so producing that which is characteristic of English unvoiced bilingual voices. Um, Spanish speakers would have trouble with B, and particularly between vowels and where it contrasts with V. So this is a little bit reductionist in nature, but it had to be for the format because I was trying to eliminate the need for teachers to read through books and books and books of information about their students' albums. And so this is what I did with it. Um, I've already told you it, it took place in a private language school in London, which I acknowledge might be one of its limitations and that this is not characteristic of English teaching around the world, but it is characteristic of English language teaching in London, and there are a lot of private language schools in London, mostly in the same square mile, and all teachers there would have these issues if they didn't speak 12 languages well enough to identify their students' like the there were five teachers, ranging from one to 12 years experience. They all teach full-time at SGI. Four of them speak English as their first language. One of them doesn't. And, and I asked them to use this grid over two weeks to inform their instruction. And I left the instructions for them fairly open because I didn't want to represent too much of an intrusion on their normal way of teaching or I felt that the results of the study probably wouldn't be realistic as to what teachers would do if they had this resource. So I timed those two weeks to coincide with two weeks that I was away, so they wouldn't perceive me to be monitoring them or influencing them or driving what they're doing. I wanted to see them in their natural habitat, as it were. And I interviewed them before and after about things like what problems their students seem to have with making themselves intelligible to their peers, how they normally approach teaching pronunciation, and so on. And I didn't mention ELF, and so the second interview after these two weeks because I didn't want that to skew any impressions of why they were doing what they were doing. They understood that the grid was based on a core of features that should help facilitate mutual intelligibility. But I didn't want to get into deep ideological arguments early for fear that that might be a bit off-putting and they wouldn't behave naturally. And then uh, we come to the findings. And I admit this was my first research project of this nature doing my master's, and I was not prepared for all hell to break loose, as it did in my view, because they didn't do exactly what I expected them to do. The first thing I found out was that their general approaches to pronunciation instruction were not as ordered as I thought. There was no systematic record of unintelligibility or intelligibility, so even though my sampling criteria had been that teachers must have identified that their students had trouble understanding each other's pronunciation. They didn't keep any record of when or how. So when I interviewed them and I asked them, can you give me an example of when your French student um, didn't understand your Chinese-speaking student? What happened? And they'd say, I know 
was always a problem. I can't remember exactly. I think it was this. And they gave me a wide range of various possible causes. Um, which leads me to this. They had difficulty identifying pronunciation issues and suggested <laughs> recognizing causes. At least in theory. They may have misidentified it, but they just weren't very confident in saying what had gone wrong. But they were confident in saying that things were going wrong. So they were behaving quite intuitively. Like, oh, I think it was a mixture of intonation and individual sounds and stress that nobody understood. Um, it wasn't planned. None of the teachers in the study, bar one, took an approach to pronunciation instruction which involved planning what they were going to cover. They very much reacted onto kind of what was actual in their classroom rather than what was potentially difficult. Um, but those that could remember, some examples identified the term vowel, the uh, which is in the lingua franca form. Um, another two teachers identified long and short vowel contrasts, which are also in the lingua franca form. So it seemed as though some of the pronunciation and communication breakdowns were involving core sounds. The teachers didn't identify them as that because they never heard of them. But it looked again as though the grid might be useful in helping them prepare. These are some of the things that they said. For me, the best way is just to observe and see what they produce. Okay. Um, I like the idea of things that emerge. So again, prioritizing what's actually happening rather than what could be a problem. This was key. So some teachers just said, well, I've got no training in teaching pronunciation, so I just react to what happens. Um, and equally, I only react to what I'm expecting to see. And this one. <laughs> so even though this teacher had elected to participate in the study on the basis of being interested in intelligibility, she was still focused on correctness and accuracy. And this teacher was a non-native speaker teacher, so in some respects she was also using English as a lingua franca with the students, because they didn't speak her first language and she didn't speak all of theirs. Although I should add that this teacher does speak quite a variety of languages. To a high level of so again, they are responding to pronunciation, they include it regularly in their instruction, but they're responding very intuitively, they're following what's in a course book. And as four of the five teachers are native speaker teachers, their intuitions are also probably influenced by native speaker norms. I think it stands to reason. Again, as you said, it's where I notice mistakes, that's where I notice mistakes. So if I'm expecting intonation to be a problem, I'll probably correct their intonation when I see them not producing it like I produce it. Using the grid, this is the moment where, as I said, all hell broke loose. Um, they didn't use it. <laughs> In short, their habits were largely unchanged. They still didn't use this to identify areas of their students' likely overlapping needs and didn't prepare a syllabus from it. They did look at it, but they didn't really know how to approach a syllabus from that perspective. So they kind of looked at it and highlighted some things, but it was a bit unprincipled. And without me there, they didn't ask anyone, and most of them didn't refer to the teacher's notes. Some of them explained this as just being, they were just too busy. They have so many classes to teach in a day. This was the beginning of the summer, we have a lot of students, and maybe they needed a bit more guidance. Some of them did identify things they wouldn't ordinarily notice, um, which I thought was encouraging. So this prompted them to think about areas where perhaps they would have neglected before. And some of them had considerable difficulty with the terminology, despite my efforts to standardize it and simplify it. Because I had to strike a balance between being linguistically accurate and being sort of user-friendly to teachers who have admitted they don't have a, um, a high degree of um, training in pronunciation and instruction. So again, to give some examples, they used it for their own theory. not to plan a lesson or prepare a syllabus, but to prepare themselves to do their usual spontaneous methods of work. Uh, this just illustrates what I said before. And these two are two examples of pronunciation terminology. I 
I should mention that before I gave the teachers the grid, or sorry, when I gave the teachers the grid, and then I left for two weeks, I gave them all 48 hours to read it and to come and ask me if they had any questions about anything on it. Any questions at all, I told them I'd be available. Nobody approached me with any questions about terminology, so I went to them and I said, are you sure you don't have any questions? Have you looked at it? And they said, yes, it was all fine. Only one question arose to define a term, and that term was lingua franca. So they felt comfortable with all of the other terminology in the grid, although later it, it uh, arose that they hadn't really understood it. Um, so having collected this sort of non-data that they didn't quite use the grid how I expected to, but again, remembering that these teachers are quite typical of the context that we teach in, I think, from my knowledge of other schools in London speaking to other teachers. Uh, then I brought up the topic of health, and I said, well, remember what I said this grid was based on, how do you feel about these issues, and so on. Um, most of the teachers were very open to non-native speaking accents. They were quite happy with variation, as they said themselves. They didn't have anything against not sounding like a native speaker, per se. But they were very, very unaware of the ELF concept. Two of the teachers had never heard it before my study. The ones who had heard of it had a kind of vague notion, but by their own admission, they weren't very familiar with what it means, and certainly not how it would uh, manifest itself in practice. They had a lot of difficulty seeing the relevance of this core of pronunciation items to their own classroom. Even though, again, my sampling criteria at the beginning um, tried to ensure that they, they had identified issues of students' mutual intelligibility being strained in their classrooms, they had difficulty connecting this with that situation, even when I tried to make that connection explicit. And the reality is that we have a mix of motivations in one class. I don't know if you can see this. We have some learners who are very much interested in English as a foreign or a second language, they come to London specifically to learn British English, which they're not getting from me. <laughs> and often they want to stay in England, or in London specifically, to work or to study. They have um, a connection somehow with the culture. That's their interest, that's what they want. And there's a, a quotation in, in Jenkins' original book that says, you know, what students want and what they need is the teacher's responsibility to deliver that. They might not need English as a lingua franca, they might need another um, type of English or another approach. Or they might need both and the ability to switch between them. But the reality is that our classrooms in London have a mix of many different learners from many different backgrounds, have <coughs> many different needs and motivations. And the teachers are a bit like, I don't know where to start with that. What's interesting is that they default to native speaker levels. One teacher said she estimated she had approximately 50% ELF users in her class, and approximately 50% EFL, so she taught EFL. But with a 50-50 split, it's interesting, I thought, that she defaults to the native speaker variety. Maybe because she is a native speaker and she's teaching in London. And a lot of the students I've spoken to about these issues say, for that very reason, even though they understand the lingua franca concept, they still prefer, they still choose to follow native speaker ones. Uh, this was the teacher who estimated the 50-50 split and mentioned the influence of the colleagues. Um, she also said, but I don't have space for the full course. It's kind of sad, actually. So the teachers identified that they didn't like this pressure from native speaking colleagues to make their students improve something that wasn't problematic in her view. But she pandered to it anyway, if that's what they felt they needed. They did acknowledge this need to communicate. There was some ambivalence. So I think it's um, as good a way as any. Um, and this was key. They just don't think it's relevant here because they don't hear anyone talking about it. So I'll just fly through my conclusions very quickly. From this, I derive that there were multiple barriers, but predominantly the circumstances of having, we have continuous enrollment, we have new students in the week. Their habits and their lack of training and pronunciation instruction. Those who were happy to talk about the course still felt that it was quite esoteric. It felt very academic and far removed from what they feel is relevant. And I think there need to be more studies like this that involve teachers in classrooms 
um, as Nikos mentioned yesterday, getting into the classroom, getting down and dirty with ELF, and not, not stopping at eight locations, but going to applications. Thank you very much.